The Defense Research and Development Organization, DRDO, has unveiled a full-scale model of a new short-range ballistic missile, or SRBM. This missile is called the BM-04. This missile was unveiled at a defense exhibition in Hyderabad last week. This missile is 11 and a half tons heavy. It's 10 meters long. It has a diameter of 1.2 meters and can be fired from a 6x6 launcher, the truck that you see in the picture. The missile has a range of between 400 and 1500 kilometers. It's believed to have a 500 kg payload. But it has a very interesting re-entry vehicle that you see at the tip of the missile. It suggests that this is yet another hypersonic missile from the DRDO. Now bear in mind that the DRDO just tested a naval hypersonic missile last November. Is this another hypersonic missile from the DRDO's stables? Joining me now to decode this new BM-04 missile is Lieutenant General P. Ravi Shankar. General Shankar, a new DRDO ace. Tell us what you can make out of this new BM-04 missile. There has not been a statement from the BR DRDO about this missile, but a lot of the specs have been released in the public. The pictures are there. Of course, the full-scale model has been released with all its specs. Tell us how important this missile is to our military. Uh, thanks a lot once again, Sandeep, for calling me over for the show. Uh, this missile is very important. Uh, first and foremost, it, I think it puts us on a different pedestal altogether. A hypersonic missile, which can be fired from a mobile launcher with a range of four, a minimum 400 to about uh, 1500 kilometers. Uh, my guess, I went through the specs of this and the hypersonic test we did. Yes. Uh, uh, both are approximately the same. I think this is the land version. What they tested that on that day last year was the naval version or the sea version. So it gives you an all-round capability. But interestingly, you have to see this missile in conjunction with the Praline missile, which was right. you know, uh, shown during the Republic Day and which we spoke of also. Yes. The Praline has a range of about 150 to 500 kilometers. Mm. This has a range of about 400 plus. Right. So you have a ceaseless, add this with the Brahmos which you have and right. you know, all that. So uh, plus the lower ranges of which you get from Pinaka and Smirch, you have now a plethora of equipment uh, which covers the entire border from you know the LAC well into the depth that's the first important thing right and similarly naval variation of this which goes to about 1500 kilometers range gives yes. you control over the Indian Ocean from any right. part of the peninsula you fire you can almost cover the Arabian Sea North Bengal uh, North uh, Bay of Bengal and well down into the Indian Ocean so I think it's a very, very great capability, hypersonic capability. Right. Which is very important. So, that's uh, the first. Uh, yes, yes. Please continue, uh, General Shankar. The second part, which is very important, is you know, um, this equipment need not be inducted into the mountains. Right. With just 400, you know, with a uh, dead range of 400. Anyway, you need to be, if you want to fire on the LAC or thereabouts, uh, 100, 200 kilometers ahead of the LAC, right. it's good to be outside the, uh, uh, the dead range. Which, which means that you can operate this missile from planes. So you don't have to push it up into the mountains and go through and all that. And if you say, just for, him, for, uh, for you know, argument's sake, right. you put it in the Eastern Command. Yes. Right, right from Silipri, you can deploy it anywhere you want, and you cover a whole swath of the LAC, right. and that too from uh, uh, you know normal planes, and so where your mobility is good, uh, you don't have need special special uh, specs for your vehicle to go up. You're not bothered about the weight of the missile. Right. You're not bothered about taking high altitude and roads and all those problems which come with it. You're not prob affected by the inclement weather which you get in high altitude. So I think this is a great capability when you have to you have to look at it from the larger sense. Right, absolutely. The the very important observations, General Shankar. The fact that you know you don't have to actually deploy this missile, uh, you know, in the mountains, and you can actually fire it from the planes. 
And you've also told us that this is actually a China-specific missile. This is meant to uh, target the PLA on the Tibetan plateau and beyond. Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, that's the way the ra look uh, uh, the range and the specs of the missile uh, uh, makes me think this way. I can use it this way as a gunner. I will think this way. And what's more, I can reach into the uh, operational and the strategic depth of Tibet. And Tibet has very few roads. Right. And the main roads which are opposite us, if you can cover them from a, you know, uh, uh, your own side, that too yes. from the plains, uh, I think we, it gives you a tremendous advantage. And that too a hypersonic. Right. Uh, and that too with a re-entry capability, which is, uh, I think, very good. Right. So explain for our viewers, General Shankar, you know, why a hypersonic missile? Why wouldn't you fire a normal ballistic missile uh, from the planes with a range of about 1,400, 1,500 kilometers? See, the thing with a hypersonic missile is that it can penetrate the enemy air defense systems clean. Right. It's very difficult for uh, the enemy air defense systems or the tracking systems to latch onto this missile and then fire a mi counter missile and then track it and all that because if you are firing at mac 5 mac 6 yes. and a, it's a there's a boost glide capability from uh, what i made out of the uh, specs right now if you have uh, you know terminal trajectories at mac 5 mac 6 the interceptor has to be at mac 8 mac 10 right which we don't have so you penetrate the uh, you know, their A two A D systems completely. Right, absolutely. Very and important uh, capability when you want to penetrate uh, the enemy's A two A D capability, which is uh, uh, the air defense bubble that exists on the Tibetan plateau. And you know, Jan Shankar, I've heard uh, the Air Force say talk about this very dense A D bubble that's been set up on the Tibetan plateau. Uh, you know, a lot of radars, interlocking uh, radars with interlocking fields of fire, missiles, all of this heavy A2 AD, which makes it really uh, difficult for the Air Force uh, to operate along the Tibetan plateau. Uh, you know, while the Air Force has a natural advantage of taking off from the planes, uh, they will find it very hard to penetrate this uh, A2 AD bubble that you mentioned. Uh, you know, so does this hypersonic missile, this new one, BM-04, does it offset our fighter strength shortfall? The fact that, you know, we can now target the uh, positions along the Tibetan plateau using the missile rather than sending manned fighter aircraft? Yeah, first and foremost, any capability of this kind is, uh, is you know, it actually reinforces your fighter capability. Right. You operate in conjunction with each other as a pairing system, you know, manned, unmanned kind of a th uh, philosophy. So that's the first thing. So you have, it gives you options. Uh, the second point which you made is, you know, it offsets your shortage of uh, manned aircraft. You, right. We all know that our aircraft is not coming online. Yes. In, whether it's Pages or AMCA or whether we're going for F-35 or we're going for advanced Rafales or whatever. Right. They're not going to be coming in time and your squadron strength is going down. But, right. To offset that in terms of numbers, you have this capability which can which is a short term capability because this is indigenous you can manufacture it at, at pace at right. scale at much lesser cost right and the same and integrated with your existing uh, offensive systems or defensive systems whichever way you look at it or your surveillance right. network and the thing and you have you maintain your capability which is i think very 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 important Right, and uh, it's not that a missile capability replaces a fighter squadron capability, yes. a fighter capability. I'm not suggesting that. All I'm saying is that in the interim period, when your fighter's strength is going down and you're not able to replace it uh, on a one-to-one -one basis, such missile capability, such firepower capability, yes, it's not only the hypersonic. Right, you also, like I said earlier, Brahmos, Brahmos. Equally fast. Yes. Brahmos also travels at about 3.5 kilo, 3 to 3.5 Mac. Yes. So that's just about lesser than hyperson uh, hypersonic. Right. So you have Brahmos, you have Pralay, you have uh, you know Pinaka, which is going to go up to 120 kilometers shortly. Yes. Uh, and if you have put a ramjet on a Pinaka, it can go up to 240 kilometers. So right. you have this capability coming up, uh, which is going to be telling. 
Right. And what it gives you is a huge deterrence capability. The Chinese right. will have to think very hard before they try any misadventure. Once these capabilities are transformed into actual deployments on ground. Right. So, you know, Jan Shankar, this missile that we just saw is, is a model. Like you said, it's a firing, uh, it doesn't seem to be a, an actual missile. It's a firing prototype, a model of a, a full-scale uh, model of a actual missile. You know, give us an idea how long this will take to go from, uh, you know, test firing to induction. Now, we've just tested one of those hypersonic missiles in November. That was the naval variant. If this is the land version of that naval variant, how long does it uh, actually have to take to get inducted into the Indian Army? Okay. Look, the naval version has been tested. Uh, the basic vehicle has been tested. There's nothing right. mo more to invent in that. The same thing will be fired here. It's only that the certain modifications will be made and you need to find a launcher on which you mount it and you fire it. So, if now that's already one year down the line and uh, I, my view is that if you want to go in for firing and testing and all that, maybe the basic, you're very clear about your hypersonic system, it will take you a couple of years. That's the uh, a rough estimate. And in a, within a year or two of that, you can deploy them. Right. So when you say a couple of years, are you talking of four and five years or even shorter uh, timelines? See, at this point of time, you have the capability of uh, your technology is established and right. you've done the testing. So if you are smart and you do parallel, keep testing, keep developing and parallelly start going for production, which has right. been the case for most of our uh, systems. Uh, then you are in a different lane. Maybe in a hurry, you can do it within three years, uh, three to four years. Uh, if it, it's, if it pinch comes to a shove kind of a thing, then go do it in within a couple of years. You, you know, you do it uh, at accelerated pace, right. two years. But I don't think we are in that kind of a situation as of now. Right, so it can be done, uh, it, it can be fielded in a very short period of time. Less than five, five years yeah. is what you're saying. Five years. Uh, you know, what has been the experience, uh, General Shankar, worldwide for hypersonic missiles? The Chinese have them. The Russian Federation has, of course, demonstrated two of these missiles in combat in Ukraine. What, what is the general uh, understanding of the utility of hypersonics uh, globally? See, China has been using it as a carrier breaker. Right. You know? They, they are using the naval version extensively, DF-17s and DF-21, uh, because they want to hit the carriers at uh, in this you, you know the uh, Western Pacific. Right. Okay. That means you need a high degree of accuracy. While China has uh, you know demonstrated this capability of firing a hypersonic with FOBs, that which yes. is a very uh, you know crucial capability. It puts them in a different league altogether, but they have not been able to give that kind of a precision which you have you need for hitting a seaborne target. Okay, that might take a little time. Uh, but having said that, but that same capability you can deploy against land forces also. So they have this capability, and probably they are ahead of us by about a couple of years. They, there's no news of their deploying this hypersonic capability against uh, in Tibet. So, but I wouldn't be surprised if they come out with one because the fact is that they are at a disadvantage in terms of aircraft. So they right. would have worked over time and deployed it. We wouldn't know. We at this point of time, like I said, overall air power, there's the balance. We are better off. And fighter aircraft, yes, uh, they are better off missile systems and vice versa. But give two, three years more in the advances which we have made, and if uh, you know Tejas comes in and uh, you know we get this 404 engine and 414 engine, and things go as scheduled for our fighters and missile technology, we just have to invest into the production part. The technology development is already there. That's a sunk cost which is. We put that cost not now. We've, we've been putting the technology cost in uh, from the 80s, late 80s, ever since I was uh, there in the, the IGMDP in 1988. So right. that's not much. So we can mm -hmm. do it at scale and pace. So I think we are on a good track. I think we are in a good space in this uh, position. 
my view is that we need to do more for integration isr right. right space those are the things that i think we need to really focus on we need to focus on ai based um, you know domain awareness right uh, which is very important in this kind of a situation um, uh, we, the faster we do that the better it is right when you say and integrate isr it's basically the sensor shooter link uh, yeah, needs to be strengthened yeah the sensor shooter link because see these targets are going to be in depth it's not going to be that right. you're going to get the target easily so you have to acquire the target and you have to hit the target at the time you need you know you can hit a target any time but all these targets when you hit the effect is time specific mm. so you have to be very clear when you're hitting it and why you're hitting it and that is the deterrent capability you can put in okay so if you want to interdict the area and seal off an area so that there's no ingress or egress you have to do it at a, the right time at the right place and that right. capability you'll only get if you have good isr right and that isr also has to be a mix of human uh, special forces insertions right uav space uh, electronic methods they mean right. whole lot that's a huge chapter as right. much as you develop your uh rockets and missiles and all that yes that story has to come up and i think we are not get uh put that in place and we are not we are not at, i think we need to do a lot of work on that we need to do a lot of work on that indeed uh, general shankar but thank you very much very scintillating uh, observations just on that missile uh, uh, you know model that we just saw you know hopefully it will translate into a full firing a uh, model a, a full firing prototype and we'll come back to you for your comments on that hypersonic missile but thank you very much uh, general shankar